Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the chance to come and talk about our work from the, the other side of the Midwest here. Uh, acknowledge my co-authors while I'm up here and the variety of uh, organizations that uh, they work with and uh, we work for with these uh, fish habitat remediation projects. Uh, so we work with these projects in the uh, St. Clair River and Detroit River over here, uh, affectionately we call the St. Clair Detroit River system. Um, they're kind of unique regardless of what world of streams you come from. Uh, St. Clair River, uh, approximately 40 miles long, uh, fairly deep, uh, 50, 60 feet deep in sections, um, has one of the largest freshwater deltas in the world down at the end with the distributory channels that lead in the Lake St. Clair. Uh, and moves about 180,000 CFS of water year-round, a very constant flow in this. The Detroit River, very similar, uh, similar output at 180,000 CFS, about 28 miles long. Uh, the southern end gets up to about a mile wide. Uh, historically in these systems, uh, we had huge runs of fish spawning in the system, supported the largest commercial fishery in the Great Lakes. Today, uh, it still supports much of Lake Erie's commercial catch, valued at roughly $2 billion a year. We have 65 species of fish, uh, 16 threatened and endangered, and the largest remaining lake surgeon population in the Great Lakes. So this is our, our sort of diagram on our uh, adaptive management approach to these uh, successive fish spawning habitats we've been through. It's not quite as complicated as that beaver one we saw yesterday, but after hearing about the parachutes and the pumpkins, uh, it makes a little bit more sense that we're a little simpler than they are. Uh, but really, the keys here are these two feedback loops in the middle, where we adjust our hypothesis and adjust our strategies. And several of our projects have made a couple laps here in the middle before we've continued on uh, with the bigger loop and moved on to, to new projects. So it starts with problem identification. Uh, this quote from a book published in 1839 uh, talks about how pristine the system was, and all of our systems were quite pristine when they were undeveloped, but this one was particularly prolific for fish production, even on the scale of the Great Lakes. Uh, we had a lot of channelization that went on, and that's the kind of the main cause of our mid-channel habitat destruction that happened here. This is a picture of the Detroit River after it was dewatered in the section for construction of the Livingston Channel. Uh, we had a bedrock uh, sill here, erosion resistant, so we had this nice exposed honeycomb bedrock on the bottom, and then that was dewatered, blasted, and channelized so that the big ships could get through with enough draft to, to carry the size loads that they wanted to move through this system. We had 28 species of fish that used 35 spawning sites in these areas. Uh, and a nice takeaway from this diagram here is even if you weren't right in the path of where they were dredging for the shipping channels, where the uh, dredged spoils were disposed uh, covered a far greater area than what was actually dredged for the shipping channels. So they were disturbing river bottom far outside of where they were dredging, as well as creating above water compensating works to maintain water levels and flows through these channels, which altered the flow structure through this whole section of the river, whether you were affected by dredging, spoil dumping, or not, the flow structure was changed, uh, slowed and altered, so that all of those habitats were changed. We have lots of shoreline development in the system. We're highly urbanized, the lower Detroit River is lined with still mills. The upper St. Clair River has a section we commonly refer to as a chemical alley. There's several chemical plants up there, uh, and you won't be surprised to know that that leads to water quality issues for us. Although we're greatly improved, since the 70s and the Water Quality Act, uh, we still have issues with contaminated sediments and uh, issues with water quality. So we kind of knew what was wrong. We lead into this pre-assessment of the system. We wanted to get a picture of what, what baseline conditions were like before we started these habitat remediation projects. Uh, and this is kind of a two-part thing. So there was initial assessment done before we started these projects to have baseline conditions for the system as a whole, but then we sort of do mini pre-assessments uh, on the specific sites that we select for these projects to make sure that we know what's going on specifically in those areas in terms of fish use uh, or habitat use by other species. We develop an hypothesis. Lack of spawning habitat is limiting fish production in our system. 
For the species of fish we're dealing with, spawning habitat is generally the rarest, hardest to find habitat type for them. Uh, and with the destruction of those habitat types through the channelization and shoreline development, uh, our hypothesis was that's what was missing. We're really focusing on the commercially, recreationally important fishes as well as the threatened and endangered fish, walleye, lake whitefish, lake sturgeon, northern mad tom, some of the main species that we target with these reef construction projects. Consensus building. We have lots and lots of partners on these. We have multi-jurisdictional international partners. We're working in international waters. We have obligations to, to keep lots of different groups involved and in informed in this. Uh, and it takes a lot of uh, support to get projects of this scale done. They are not inexpensive projects to do, uh, and without funding sources such as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative becoming available, we wouldn't be able to do nearly as many of these projects as we've been able to do. Prioritization and strategy development. Siting is a big one for us. The first projects that were done were a bunch of experts and people with uh, hands-on knowledge of these systems sitting in a room and pointing at maps and coming up with places to put these things, kind of an a priori uh, selection process of, of where these reefs would go. As these projects evolve and develop into system-wide modeling to help us pinpoint areas to look at for further site assessment while allowing us to look at the system as a whole. Uh, the siding, uh, construction design and timelines. Uh, our early projects were highly experimental. We used multiple rock types. They were fairly small reef beds. We had multiple individual beds within a certain project site. Uh, we used a cross-channel layout so there was a no-miss design. If they were fish in the area, we wanted to make sure that they saw rock on the bottom somewhere. And that's evolved for us into some of our more later projects where we moved to a single rock type. Uh, we orient, oops. Uh, long, narrow beds oriented with flow to maximize flow velocities over the reef sites, uh, really enhance their placement within the channel, uh, and minimize sedimentation impacts as water flows over these reefs. Construction methods have varied throughout our projects as well. Uh, early ones were done with these GPS guided clamshell dumps, each crane dump GPS guided in place, and we would get output files of where each uh, scoop of rock went in the river. Some of our projects moved into uh, using these dump barges here. Uh, they'd go out, they'd stud the barge in place, you knock the pins out of place and it's kind of instant reef on the bottom. Uh, some of our, our very recent projects have used a variation of these dump barges where it's a side dump barge. Works in a similar process but it tips to the side rather than opening straight on the bottom. We do evaluation as well as pre-assessment evaluation. We go back after construction of these reefs uh, and do side scan sonar. We get uh, remote underwater video of the reef sites and we send divers down to look at the reefs. This video here was a, a, our middle channel reef project. This was actually still during construction. There were still barge cranes on site. Um, we sent divers down to check the progress of the construction and they brought cameras and we were very surprised to find sturgeon all over our reef site even before construction was complete. This rock hadn't even been in the water a week when this video was taken here. Uh, we also do the biological assessment pre and post for the reef site. So we're doing gill netting, set lining, uh, bongo net sampling for larval transport downstream from the reef sites uh, as well as using egg mats to assess spawning activity on the reef sites and then our controls up and downstream of those sites. Uh, when I say we with this, it's not just us, not just our agency, but it's our collaboration of the agencies that are working together to get this amount of work done. Communication and outreach, part of our evaluation process. We need to communicate with our stakeholders and our partners what's been done and what's going on and how well we think it's going. We also try very hard to engage the public in these efforts. Uh, as we've started searching for, for more and new reef sites, uh, we need permission from landowners to put rock on their river bottom. And so having them involved and knowing what's going on from the get-go has been very important for having support to get these projects done. We also try to do outreach and museum exhibits. Uh, it contributes to the overall success of these projects and to the overall remediation of the system as a whole. 
our application of new knowledge in these. What do we learn? How do we apply that? The, the adaptive management aspect of these reef projects. So for our Belle Isle Reef, one of the things they had done with the design is they had put anchor stones at the heads of the reef, thinking it would help hold the rock in place against higher flows, uh, ice scouring, passing freighters, things like that. Well, it turns out that that creates an eddy behind the big anchor stones at the heads of the reefs, so and we've got these sediment shadows that are infilling the reef behind those anchor stones and reducing the usable reef area. We don't use those anymore. Fighting Island Middle Channel Reefs, where we use the mix of rock types and the across-channel no-miss design. Well, it turns out certain parts of the channel are more subject to sedimentation than others, and we start seeing some infill in the, the outs uh, outside beds of those reefs, uh, and we see preferences in the rock type use. So we've stopped doing the across channel no miss layout. We've stopped using the mix of rock types, uh, moved out of that sort of experimental design. We've learned that siding in the highest flow velocities available within that reach is very important, both for attracting the fish as well as for maintaining clean interstitial space in these reefs. A Hearts Lights Reef, one of the ones that was just constructed just the, this past fall, um, we used the uh, the, the contractor decided they need, needed to use the side dump barge for construction of this. Well, it resulted in very uneven placement of the rock, which we discovered doing one of our post-construction -construct assessments. So they're going to need to go back and smooth that over to get the distribution and the, and the kind of setup on the rock we need on the river bottom to meet uh, the planning requirements. We've also, with the Hearts Lights Reef, there was a uh, it's one of the areas where the property owners owned the river bottom to the Thalweg or the international border, whichever came first. We had a group of property owners right in the middle of our big reef site we had planned that didn't want us to put rock on their river bottom. Uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't even know they owned the river bottom before we told them, but uh, we had to turn our one big reef site into a fairly big reef site and a smaller reef site with a, a nice gap in the middle to accommodate them. So, keeping the public involved early on and being, being flexible in your designs and being able to adapt to these things, they don't come up until you're well into the process of getting these projects done. It's important to, to keep those in mind and as you cycle through these projects, um, important for us to work with what we've learned and what we've built on. So projects complete so far. Our group has done five completed projects. Uh, we have a sixth one that is just in the very final stages of permitting right now, uh, slated for construction this spring. Uh, all told, when we're done, we'll have created about 12 and a half acres of spawning reef between the two systems. And we are looking at moving on to new projects. We were fortunate enough through our consensus building and our partnerships that uh, these reef projects were written into the BUI delisting guidelines, both the St. Clair River and Detroit River are designated areas of concern. Um, we have fulfilled the St. Clair River mid-channel BUI delisting guidelines for habitat remediation, uh, and we are looking at one or two more sites, depending on size, for the Detroit River to fulfill their BUI delisting guidelines uh, in the future, moving down the road. It's been great having that kind of support. When your work is recognized and it's written into the delisting guidelines, it makes these successive projects that much easier. It's that much easier to find funding. It's that much easier to have agency support. You can hit the ground running rather than starting from scratch with each project. So I will try to find that last slide again. Uh, the paper on this is published in Restoration Ecology. It's available online. It's not out in print yet. Uh, there's the reference for that. Uh, I'll offer thanks again and take any questions. Save your feet, Dale. You know, I got gr grew up in a household of farmers. Uh, hey, then, I was wondering if you were uh, in touch with the folks on the St. Mary's AOC where they're looking at the restoration on the Little Rapids. Uh, I've been, I'm on a separate project with the Corps of Engineers, um, and that's come up in several of our calls there where they're thinking about putting in some spawning material uh, above or below one of their structures up there. Not the Rapids project specifically, but uh, the Corps has a bunch of rock available that they'd like to do something with. And so we're going to start exploring areas up there. 
We've thought about looking at the feasibility of exporting our methodologies to the St. Mary's. Um, we were lucky enough to have three different hydrodynamic models that had been completed and published that we could get results from to use in our macro modeling to do site selection. The St. Mary's does not have that same information available for it. Uh, and so looking at their system in terms of system wide, uh, it's a little bit harder to do. There's a little bit more work to be done to get to the same point. But we'd certainly like to be involved up there. That be model may be available now in Little Rapids. Is it? It'd be, if you have a reference for that or a place to go looking, I'd love to know. We'd, we'd like to look into that. I can give you some information. Thank you. Okay, now the question? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I don't need a mic. Uh, so, do you have any sense of the differential success upstream and downstream on the reefs? Because one usually thinks of sturgeon migrating upstream. Spawn, yeah, so that... It's, it's a very interesting question. So in the St. Clair River, the head of the St. Clair River, um, right at the uh, outflow of Lake Huron, is probably it is the most um, used sturgeon spawning area in particular in the entire system. Right at the head of the river, it's very, very deep. We've got very high flow velocities there for our system. Uh, and lots and lots of sturgeon go to use that. In the Detroit River, our first project which was built as a sturgeon spawning reef, was put up near the head of the river at Belle Isle. They've never gotten a sturgeon egg on those reefs. We get lots of other species using those reefs, documenting lots of other spawning. Uh, it's provided habitat for the endangered northern mad tom. Sturgeon move through the area. We've got uh, some sturgeon telemetry projects that show sturgeon are moving around there. We don't get sturgeon eggs on the reefs. We see those uh, farther down the Detroit River. Some of our mid-channel reefs there have been far more successful uh, and closer to documented sturgeon home areas in the literature than the reef at the head of the Detroit. So it really seems to be system dependent for that one. Other questions? We have time. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.